<clears throat> Let's open our Bibles together for our scripture reading to Isaiah 42. <clears throat> Very familiar passage, <clears throat> Isaiah 42. And while you're looking that up, um, the Lord took uh, Florence Recente home last night about 5.30. Uh, she was staying with her, with uh, um, Jim's brother up in Virginia. But uh, they're, they're all doing well. She's 91. <clears throat> Isaiah 42, beginning in verse 1. Behold, my servant. Look to Christ. That's another way to say that. Look to Christ. Behold, my servant. Whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. And he shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. And that's exactly what he did. He satisfied the law and fulfilled all justice by the sacrifice of himself. And he did it for the Gentiles. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. He's not running around trying to get a following. <clears throat> a bruised reed shall he not break. And a smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail nor be discouraged till he has set judgment in the earth and the isles shall wait for his law. Thus saith God the Lord, he that created the heavens and stretched them out, he that spread forth the earth and that which cometh out of it, he that giveth breath unto the people upon it and spirit to them that walk therein, I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness and will hold thine hand and keep thee and give thee for a covenant to the people for a light of the Gentiles to open the blind eyes to bring out the prisoners from the prison and then that sit in darkness out of the prison house I am the Lord that is my name and my glory will I not give to another neither my praise to graven images. Let's pray together. Our merciful Heavenly Father, we come before Thee having all our hope in the Lord Jesus Christ for all our acceptance, for the forgiveness of our sin, for all our righteousness, Lord, we have just read from your word that we are to behold thy servant. Lord, we need your Holy Spirit to enable us to do that. We pray that you would give us the grace to set aside those things that so easily beset us, the distractions of this world and this life, and give us the the faith to set our affections on the Lord Jesus Christ. Pray that you'd bless your word, open our hearts. We uh, pray for the Recenti family. We thank you for Florence. We ask, Lord, that you would give to, to Jim and Rachel and Gigi and, and the other members of the family the the grace to, to uh, rejoice in the hope of eternal life that we have in Christ. For it's in his name we ask it. Amen. Number 311 from the hardback hymnal, 311. And let's all stand together. <clears throat> Okay. 
shape of our life. We would see Jesus, our weak faith to strengthen for the last weariness, the final strife. We would see Jesus, the great rock foundation, where on our feet were set by sovereign grace, not life nor death with all their agitation can thence remove us if we see his face. We would see Jesus, other lights are paling, which for long years we have rejoiced to see. The blessings of our pilgrimage are failing. We would not mourn them, for we go to Thee. We would see Jesus, this is all we Every time I stand in this pulpit, looking on the back wall, sir, we would see Jesus. And that is our hope and prayer, that the Lord would be pleased to reveal himself to us and give us faith to, to rest in him and love him and believe on him. <clears throat> I've, uh, I've titled this message, Death of God's Saints. The death of God's saints. And um, our, our text can be found in Psalm 116. Psalm 116, if you'd like to turn with me there. You're familiar with this passage. This is a verse of scripture that's often quoted at funerals. And that certainly is one of the aspects in which God's people die. But I want us to look this, this evening at the five ways in which the death of God's saints is precious in his sight. Look with me there at verse 15. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. That word precious means priceless, infinitely valuable in the sight of God is the death of his saints. If it's infinitely valuable in his sight, then surely it ought to be in ours. And uh, I want us to see the significance of the death of God's saints and, to, and in terms of why it is so priceless. It's priceless because in the death of God's saints, we have the atonement for sin. In the death of God's saints, we have the benefit of that atonement through faith. And in the death of God's saints, we have the fulfillment of that atonement in his perfect likeness. Now, 
Obviously, we're talking about more than just the passing from this world into the next. We're talking about more than just that time that the Lord has ordained for each one of us. It is appointed unto man once to die. We're talking about the death of God's saints who have always been seen in Christ before the foundation of the world. And Christ Jesus the Lord is that lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. And precious, priceless is the atoning work of the Lord Jesus Christ as we are in him and as he was slain, so are we. The death of God's saints is seen in the fulfillment of that covenant promise that the Lord Jesus made with his father when he went to Calvary's cross and he offered himself up as a sacrifice for sin and he died and we died in him crucified with Christ the death of God's saints is seen when we die to our own righteousness that's a miracle of grace when God makes us to be a sinner and we see for the first time in our lives that we have no righteousness whatsoever within ourselves and we're completely dependent upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Most people live in a false hope of a righteousness that they don't have. What a blessing it is when the Spirit of God comes and slays us and makes us dependent upon Christ alone for our righteousness. We die daily as believers in Christ. We are, we are brought to the end of ourselves every day to depend upon Him and that, that death is experienced in faith every day and then we have the death of the saints that will be experienced when this mortal is made immortal and this corruptible is made incorruptible and we're made like him in perfection without sin i was thinking about the point that i made sunday about believers you know we want everything now <laughs> we want to be done with sin we want to understand everything we want to be mature and you know we just well that's going to happen one day that's going to happen one day but not until we shed this body of of death and uh, that's what we long for isn't it to be without sin and to see him in the perfection of his glory and righteousness and that's precious in the sight of the Lord. You see, all those things are precious in the sight of the Lord. It's kind of like asking the question, when are we saved? When are we saved? You see, those five points are relevant to our salvation as well. We're saved from the foundation of the world. We're saved when Christ died on Calvary's cross. We're saved when we hear the gospel as the gospel and brought to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We're being saved every day. As the Lord brings us again and again and again to the Lord Jesus to trust him. And one day we shall be saved. <laughs> so, you know, men who don't know the scriptures, I fear they, they try to make salvation a time thing. And... Um, and they only are able to understand it in relationship to this life of, of, that we live in, this bubble of time, if you will. But our God's eternal, and everything he does is eternal. And um, if we're given the faith to believe all that he said in his word, we'll be able to say, precious in the sight of the Lord. <laughs> And precious in my sight is the death of his saints. Look, look, look at the uh, verses around this verse in Psalm 116. In verse 13, I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. Now you know who that's, who, who's speaking there. It was the Lord Jesus who said, Father, if there be any way this cup can pass from me, nevertheless, let it be done. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Oh, the cup of sin that the Lord Jesus would drink on Calvary's cross to satisfy God's justice. And he says, I'll take the cup of salvation. <laughs> and, uh, and when the Lord gives us that cup, we receive that cup, don't we? 
He came into his own, his own received him not, but as many as received him to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. We, he makes us willing, and he, he hands us that cup, and we take that cup gladly. And we, we celebrate that every time we, we uh, celebrate the Lord's table, the cup that the Lord drank from, and, uh, and the body that he died in. Look at verse 14. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. And that's exactly what he did. The Lord Jesus Christ entered into a covenant relationship with his father and promised to be the surety of his people. And he bore their sins. And he said, I'll, I'll fulfill my vows. I'll keep all of my promises. There's our hope. What greater hope could we have? What hope is there in thinking that God somehow is going to save me based on how faithful I've been to my promises? There's no hope there. There's nothing but fear. But the hope of knowing that the Father's salvation is determined on the faithfulness of the Lord Jesus in keeping his vows and his promises, there I can rest. There I can, I can, I can be still and know that he is God. So the verse 15 says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, truly I am thy servant. I am thy servant and the son of thy handmaid. Thou hast loosed my bonds. And Christ is speaking here, but, but the believer is, is understanding that the Lord has loosed our bonds, the bonds of fear and the bonds of death. This... Uh, Death is something that men live in fear of all their lives. Look at, uh, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 2. We've looked at this verse many times. I want us to see, just for the next few minutes, what does the scripture say about spiritual and physical death? Because most people either live in denial of it, or they live in a false hope. And the scripture says, if you know the truth, the truth shall set you free. <laughs> what, what glorious rest there is in knowing exactly what death is and what the Lord has accomplished through the death of Christ and, um, and how, he's conquered, how he's conquered the grave. Look at, uh, look at Hebrews chapter 2, beginning... At verse 14, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. The bondage of fear. And, and you know, that... It's a good thing. It's a good thing to, 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 to realize that my covenants with death are not sufficient. You know, Isaiah, the Lord said, they made a covenant with death. <laughs> we inhale, withheld their in agreement. Uh, but their covenant will be disannulled. What a blessed thing it is when God's children can't be satisfied with that covenant that they've made. And the Lord grips their heart in fear of death and then delivers them from that fear by showing them what he has done in destroying the works of the devil. What did uh, Paul say in 1 Corinthians 15? Oh, death, where is thy sting? <laughs> where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Thanks be to God, we have the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ, who kept the law and put away sin. Death is a result of sin. I tell you, the very, very first thing that God told us in Genesis, of the trees of the garden you may eat, but of the tree in the midst of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat, and the day that you eat of it, you shall surely surely die and we ate it and we died 
And then the Lord Jesus Christ <laughs> took on our flesh and died our death to deliver us from the fear and the bondage of death. This is our, this is our hope. <clears throat> we, uh, so our, 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 first, our first death is seen in the Lord Jesus by virtue of our union with him. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4. Turn to me to that passage. Ephesians 1 4. Verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. What? Here's... Here. You see, God has always seen his people in Christ. He put them in Christ before the foundation of the world. All their blessings are in Christ. They were blessed in Christ before the world was made. And we're blessed in Christ now as he's seated as our advocate and our sin bearer before the Father. Here's our... And Revelation chapter 13 verse 8 says that he is the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. Before the foundation of the world. So when, when was it precious in the sight of God, the death of his saints? Well, first, when the Lord Jesus entered into that covenant. And, you know, we have to use language that is so, is so limited. We talk about eternity past and we talk about the Lord Jesus entering into a covenant. There was never a time when he wasn't in that covenant relationship with his father there was never a time when he wasn't our advocate before the father there was never a time that he wasn't the lamb slain before the foundation of the world we can't we can't enter into that eternal existence before time was but here he is here he is and it was precious in god's sight the death of his saints it was it was priceless. It was of great value, of eternal value, infinite value. Hebrews chapter 4, if you'll turn with me there. You remember Hebrews chapter 3 talks about those Israelites that wandered in the wilderness of this world and because of their unbelief, they did not believe God. They died in the wilderness. The scripture says their carcasses rotted in the desert. Now there's a, there's a death that we don't want anything to do with. Let us therefore, chapter 4 verse 1, let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Let us fear God. Let us come before him. To fear God is to believe God, is to know that it's to fear, to fear standing in the presence of God without the Lord Jesus Christ as your advocate. Do you fear that? Do you fear the thought of that? Having to stand in the presence of a holy God and represent yourself? That's a fearful thing. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an, of a, of an angry God. For unto us was the gospel preached. Here's the good news. <laughs> unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached to them did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. They didn't believe it. Same gospel was preached to them. The manna, the manna came down from heaven. That was the gospel being preached to them. The water coming out of the rock. That was the gospel being preached to them. The law that God gave them and and, and, and they said to Moses, they said, we'll do it. <laughs> that was the gospel preached to them. And Moses said, you can't do this. And he sprinkled them with blood and he offered a sacrifice. There's the gospel. 
And look at verse 3. For we which have believed do enter into rest. We don't live our lives in denial or in fear. We rest in the Lord Jesus Christ. As he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if any shall enter into my rest, though the works were finished from the foundation of the world. <laughs> Chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. The works were finished before the foundation of the world. But why well, thought the Lord Jesus had to go to the cross to finish the work? Well, he did in time. In time, he did. And that's where we live. And he was made in the likeness of sinful flesh and born of a woman born under the law to redeem those who are cursed by the law. He had to do that in time. But he was only fulfilling in time what had already been determined in eternity. You know, here's the glorious truth, brethren. Our God's eternal and everything he does is eternal. And he knows the beginning of the end and nothing can be added to it or taken away from it. And Everything that happens in time has already happened in eternity. It's already happened. There's, not, there's, no, there's no such thing as a, as a happenstance or a, or a coincidence or an accident or a mistake. There's no such thing as that. Not, not if we're understanding who our God is and believing that he is sovereign over all things. And here we see the, the ultimate example of that where the Lord Jesus did go to the cross in order to fulfill what was already purposed of God in eternity. When was it precious in the sight of the Lord, the death of his saints? When Christ, in eternity past, was our surety, our, our sin bearer. The works were finished from the foundation of the world. <laughs> Secondly, it is precious in the sight of the Lord when the Lord Jesus Christ, the God-man, bore our sins in his body upon Calvary's cross, and we died in him. In him. That's what Galatians 2.20 says. Paul said, I was crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me, died for me. We were in him. And it was prayed, it, it pleased, Isaiah chapter 53, verse 10, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. It was precious in the sight of the Lord when God poured out his wrath and put to death his son. That, that's, that, turn with me to Acts, uh, Hebrews, uh, um, Isaiah chapter 53. Say, so how could that be? Remember the word precious doesn't mean delightful. We call small children precious. It means priceless. It means etern of eternal infinite value. That cannot, you cannot put a price on it. And so God, in pouring out his wrath on Christ, was fulfilling that, that covenant that had been established in eternity past. And, and it was priceless in his sight. Isaiah chapter 53, look at verse, look at verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He bore our sins. He was cut off from the land of the living for the transgressions of his people was he stricken. Yet, verse 10, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. Anybody that says that the Lord Jesus was just fulfilling a legal contract that he made with his father in heaven and uh, kind of taking the sins of his people and pasting them on him, uh, that's not what this says. His soul was made an offering for sin. He's the one who, who felt the full burden of sin. God makes us to be sinners. We, we come to realize for the first time, 
I have no righteousness and I can't stand in the presence of God like this. I've got to have Christ and Christ is the only thing that, the only one that can make me acceptable in his sight. Verse, the latter part of verse 10, he, the father, shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. <laughs> God the father not only saw the Lord Jesus on Calvary's cross, but he saw his seed. And Isaiah, boy, you there in Isaiah 55, 50, uh, learn, turn over just a few pages to Isaiah chapter 66. Um, look at verse 22 of Isaiah 66. And as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. Now the Father speaking of Christ, your seed shall remain. <laughs> the church is the seed of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God saw the travail of his soul and God was satisfied and God saw his seed. And it was precious. It was of infinite value. It was priceless in the sight of God. The death of his saints. <laughs> we died in Christ. You see, this death that we're, that, that we're talking about isn't just, isn't just the, the death that all men will experience in the end. It is, it is the death of the Lord Jesus. Turn with me to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Verse 19, for by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So also by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. God the Father made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And just as we died in our father Adam, we were made alive in the Lord Jesus Christ. Moreover, verse 20, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ. What shall we say then? <laughs> shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. We were in Christ. We died in Christ. We've, sin's been put away. The Lord gives to his people a, a holy hatred for their sin. We don't, we don't relish in it and long for it. <laughs> um, that's what he goes on to say. Look, look at verse 3. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we might walk in newness of life. For if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. We've been raised with Christ. That's what Paul meant when he said, I've not yet apprehended him. I'm still wrestling with this sin problem. But he's apprehended me. And my desire is to know him and the fellowship of his suffering and, uh, and the power of his resurrection. <laughs> that when Christ died, I died. That's my only, my only power over sin is the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, uh, and, to be, and to be told and reminded again by the Spirit of God that I've been raised a new man in Christ Jesus, there's my only, there's my only power over sin. Scripture says that he entered in once to the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. So we died when Christ died. 
And when he entered into the holies of holies and put his blood on the mercy seat, all those for whom he died entered in with him. And uh, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Now, thirdly, we die to our righteousness and to ourselves when the Lord Jesus makes himself known to us. When he, when he calls us by his grace and makes us to be sinners and makes us willing to believe on him and gives us the faith to rest our hope in him, we have to die to ourselves. Um, <clears throat> it is precious in the sight of the Lord when God's elect are brought by the Spirit of God to die to their own righteousness. You've got your Bibles open to Romans. Look at Romans 7. Look at Romans 7 at verse 9. Paul says, for I was alive without the law once. <laughs> you remember what he said in his testimony? He said, concerning the law, I was blameless. I mean, he knew the law, but he didn't have the law. <laughs> it wasn't until the law said, thou shalt not covet, that he realized, wait a minute, this thing of law keeping is a matter of the heart. It's not just a matter of my outward expressions and behavior. And uh, he said, I was alive once without the law. Before the law came, I was, you know, I was trusting in all the things I was doing for the hope of my salvation. And look what he says. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. <laughs> there is precious in the sight of the Lord the death of his saints. And that's why men won't come to Christ. They won't, they don't want to die to themselves. We'll not have this man reign over us. They, they, they want to, you know, they, they, they want to be the captain of their own ship and the master of their own destiny. And, you know, if we just, they, they won't bow. They won't die. But that's what, that's what salvation is. Salvation is the death of his saints. When the law came, sin revived. And I died. There's the work of grace in the heart of God's people. <laughs> when he causes us to see for the first time, behold, I am vile. I am vile. I've never been able to keep God's law. If I've got to stand and be judged by the law of God, I, I'm going to be condemned to eternal death, the eternal hell. Woe is me. I'm undone. <laughs> A man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips. In me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Now that's spiritual death. That's it's when the Spirit of God takes the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and slays us. And it's a two-edged sword. <laughs> he kills with it and he heals with it. And uh, what, a, what a blessing. To have the sword of the spirit pierce our hearts and cause us to, to die to ourselves and to give up on all of our false hopes and false righteousness. When um, the Lord told Isaiah to speak words of comfort to Israel, to Jerusalem. He said, speak ye comfortably to them. And you remember Isaiah and Isaiah 40 said, well, Lord, where do I begin this message? Where do I, where do I start? You remember what the Lord said? Tell them they're grass. <laughs> Just tell them they're grass. Tell them they have no righteousness. Tell them they're, 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 they have no substance in themselves. And then they'll, they'll die to themselves. They'll quit dependent upon themselves for the hope of their salvation. Fourthly, it is precious in the sight of the Lord as all of God's elect are renewed in faith day by day to reckon themselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God by Jesus Christ. You see this, what Paul was talking about in Romans chapter 7 is our daily experience. I was alive without the law, but when, when the law came, sin revived and I died. And uh, 
The Lord is merciful to bring his children under the conviction of their sin and bring them again and again and again. Paul said, I die daily, daily. I have to die to myself, die to my own righteousness, die to my own, my own desires and my own, and, and look to him and bow to him and worship him and love him. That's a, that's a spiritual death. Keep coming. To whom coming? So we, this, this believer's life in this world is a life of death, isn't it? It's just constantly dying. <laughs> well, you see, this isn't a subject we're afraid to talk about. This is the hope of our salvation. <laughs> you know, the, the world would think, well, you guys are awfully, awfully uh, depressing, you know, talking about dying all the time. No, this is our hope. Christ died for me. The work is finished from the foundation of the world. The lamb that was slain, and that Christ went to Calvary's cross in time and fulfilled the covenant promises through his death, and that my hope of salvation is that I was in him, and that when Christ died, I died. When he rose from the dead, I rose from the dead. And now the blessing of having him send his spirit to me and slay me <laughs> and cause me to quit trying to work my way to heaven die to myself and come alive unto God through Jesus Christ. And then this daily walk. We're just, we're dead men walking, aren't we? In a sense, you know, the, where our, our physical life is, is, is a life of constant. Reckon yourselves to be dead indeed into sin. We, we're constantly stabbing the flesh, aren't we? We're we're uh, mortifying the flesh, is what the scripture says. That's, that's dying. To mortify the flesh is to put the flesh to death every day. And then the great, great hope of all of this is that one day in the Lord's time, just like he did for our sister Florence yesterday, he will appoint a moment when we'll draw our final breath and the angels in glory will come and take us home and we'll be made like him without sin. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation 21. That'll be precious in the sight of the Lord. When, his, when each one of his saints enter into glory, oh, is there something of infinite value to that? And great rejoicing in heaven. Verse chapter, chapter 21 of Revelation, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. No more turbulence, no more separation. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Weddings are a time of great rejoicing, aren't they? And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God. That's Christ. He's the one who's tabernacled among us. We beheld his glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. The tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor cry, neither shall there be any more pain for the former things are passed away. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. God's people, if they've, if they've believed that Christ is the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world, that he died on Calvary's cross to put away their sin, they've been brought to die to themselves 
and rest all their hope in Christ for their righteousness and their daily struggle with sin causes them to die daily, then they have no reason to fear when they, when they leave this world. He's destroyed the works of the devil. He's conquered death. <laughs> He's provided this for us. He that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Right, for these words are true and faithful. Where else are you going to get true and faithful words like this? What hope does the world have to offer us that's this kind of hope? Sure hope. True and faithful hope. The world can't offer it to us. Pious platitudes is the best they can give us. Peace, peace when there is no peace is the best they can give us. This is real hope. This is true hope. And he said unto me, look at verse, at verse 6. It is done. <laughs> it's done. It's finished. Oh, the work was finished before the foundation of the world, but now it's done. Now the, the fruition of everything that was purposed by God for all of eternity and accomplished by Christ in this world is now brought to its fullness. It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega the beginning and the end. And I will give unto him that is the thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely, freely. You don't do anything to earn this. It's a free gift. We read in Isaiah chapter 40 at the beginning of the service, I am God, I am the Lord, and that is my name, and I'll not share my glory with another. If it wasn't free then we could take some credit for having earned it. But the fact that it's completely free and completely accomplished by him gives to him all the glory, doesn't it? Precious in the sight of the Lord. And whatever is precious in his sight will be precious in our sight. Is the death of his saints. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, bless your word, increase our faith, and forgive us for our unbelief. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. 143. 143. Let's stand together. 143.